Welcome to the Camden and Rockport Historical Society. My name is Frank Carr. I'm the president of the society this year. And we're privileged this afternoon to have a speaker about art restoration. And as you can see, we can use his tips uh, here. And uh, our guest's name is Blakey Hines. And he's an author and restorer. He's been in the business for over 25 years. And he's worked with some of the best people in the business uh, that tutored him. And I read in another article where he had worked on roughly 8,000 restorations over the period of 35 time. years. 35 years, yeah. that's incredible. Thank mm. you. So I would like to introduce oh, Mr. Blake. Thank Hines. you very much. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this afternoon and so glad that each one has decided to come. Hopefully this will be a time that you'll find very worthwhile and entertaining and informative. I was talking to the gentleman here in the front row about the weather and how the weather is such a cooperative factor today because believe me, it makes it much harder to haul this stuff around when the weather is bad and also for you nice folks to come out. And so my name is Blakey Hines and my wife is Judy Hines back there in the blue cape. And why don't you just wave Judy? There you go. All right. Okay. And um, as, as it was, uh, the introduction said that I have been an art restorer for 35 years. Um, that is true. And um, I've worked on uh, approximately 8,000 paintings and frames. I, I have a specialty, and my specialty is oil paintings um, and gilded objects. Um, so that I don't, I do not work on paper, I do not work on fabric, I do not work on mechanical instruments. Each thing is a specialty in its own right. If you hit somebody that is a jack of all trades in restoring whatever, well, <laughs> that may work for engines and things like that, but it does not work in this world at all. Uh, you need to be somebody, you have somebody who's very specific in whatever it is. I, I get calls all the time from people who want me to work on paper objects, like, like these back here. This, these, are, these are on paper. Um, I don't work on paper. I, I understand how paper works, but that's a whole specialty as opposed to these, which are painted objects, oil painted objects. That I do work on. So if anybody has any questions about paper objects or even fabrics, I know people who do that, but I have some... <coughs> not do that. My wife and I moved from Connecticut up here to Maine uh, 22 years ago. We both grew up in Darien, Connecticut, which is a town just right outside of New York City, and it's a commuter town. It's a corporate town. And um, um, I was a little bit of an oddball in that town because I'm an artist, and pretty much everybody I knew was going on the trains from New York City, and it wasn't for me. Um, I got into art in a very backward sort of way. Um, I wasn't trained to do any of this, really. Um, it's, um, it's a matter of life circumstances. And I could go around the room and ask you some questions about whatever you do and how you ever got involved in what you do. And a lot of it would be an answer that would come to, well, I was a young boy or I was a young girl when I met whoever that was that either had an influence on you or some impact in your life that actually directed you in, in ways to go in your life, um, not necessarily with your vocation, but even in, in forms of living in the way that you live and the, the influence of other people. And that started with me as a young boy with friends of my grandfather who they were artists. And he had a couple of very close friends that I saw quite a bit. I was very attracted to them, not necessarily by what they did, but I was attracted by how they lived. My father was a man that got on the train for 42 years into Manhattan, uh, leave the house at 6.30 in the morning, come home at 6.30 at night. Um, oh gosh, I, I didn't have to have an alarm clock because the shower always turned on at a certain time. I didn't have to know what time it was in the evening because that door always opened and he came and he lived such a regimented life. and. Um, he never really insisted that I do. 
And uh, so these friends of my grandfather's had these lives that were, that were quite different than that. Um, not that I took hold of that as a young boy. I, I went to Ohio State University, and um, I graduated with a degree in agricultural economics. At one time, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. That's how, you know how life sends you off in these places where whatever you think you're going to do when you're 18 years old is quite different than what you are when you're 62 years old as I am. Um, who knows? And so uh, I, um, I, I, I have a degree in economics. Uh, I have a bent towards scientific things. I have a bent towards uh, analytical things. Um, and I have also this bent towards artistic things. So it's a nice combination of, of two different worlds. And so I, I, um, I definitely did that. Um, graduated from college and uh, went to England after I graduated and uh, lived in London and, and um, met artists and musicians and very interesting world. Um, they were all doing something and I was kind of doing nothing, kind of hanging out. Um, and uh, I remember one day what happened is that I, um, I picked up a pencil and a piece of paper and I decided to, I was sitting in a room and I was just going to draw that chair over there. And it was the biggest surprise of my life when I realized I could, I can. And that began my life as an artist. I was um, 23 years old and um, I began to draw. Now, anybody that has any knowledge about talent and talented people know you don't get by only on talent. You have to work at it. Everybody that I know that is a great musician, a great artist, a whatever great whatever it is, great physician, great lawyer, great whatever it is, these are people that work very hard at it. And the reason why they're really expert at it is because they've done a lot of it and because they work at it. And so you cannot become proficient in what you hope to desire or hope, what you hope to achieve in your life without working at it. And God gave us talents and each one of us has talents and so that was one of my talents. I, I started off drawing, as I said, um, uh, in a very realistic manner. I, I was drawn to that type of thing. Um, and I, um, through the course of time, had drawings that I wanted to go and frame. I, yeah, I'd like to put a picture frame on that. Um, eventually moved back to America, and I went to, over to a frame shop in the town that I grew up in, and, and I said, you know, I, I want to get this framed, and the, and the woman f designed it all, and she almost fell over when she told me how much it cost. <laughs> yeah. Gee, I don't know about that. I, I, I don't know if I can afford that. I don't know how many, I, I have so many things that I want to do, um, how, how am I ever going to do that? And so it started off, and again, in these ways that life presents itself, she worked with her husband. Hey, does your husband need any help in the back room? That was my little in to that. Started helping part-time working in a frame shop. And that's how this all began, basically, with the restorations. Um, it was a frame shop in a gallery in a very wealthy town with well-to-do people and who had things. And some of the things that they had were these paintings and frames that were in their homes. These weren't people that necessarily were collectors or people that even thought about what they had. They were generally generational pieces or pieces that they inherited through their family. And maybe you have some of that in, in your own household where you have a, a painting that you can say, I remember when I was a young girl or a young guy and I used to visit my grandmother and this painting hung in the dining room. Or, you know, when we spent the night at my grandmother's, this painting was in her bedroom. Um, that's what I work on a lot of. It. And so, that's what was coming in the store. People that had damaged paintings, people that had paintings to be cleaned, all forms of it. And that's when I began to meet the restorers. I was in my 20s, and they were men that at the time seemed quite old to me. They were like 45. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was like that. And, uh, and so anyway, um, I got to know them. Before I got to know them, I got to know what are the possibilities of what can happen in a painting that is dirty or ripped or a frame that is damaged. What can happen with this? And so that I would see over and over and over and over and over again. 
these paintings that would come in this way and then go out that way. And I began to understand the possibilities. That even somebody would come in and say, um, when Betty wasn't there or Jules wasn't there, I have a painting here, do, do you think this can be cleaned? Do you think it can be repaired? Yes, it can. How much would it cost? Well, I'm not the restorer. You need to talk to the restorer. And so I began to understand that part of it, about what the possibilities are, but didn't really understand how to do it. And then I also began to understand, oh, gee, you know, clean, clean, clean the painting like this by that, I could see that, gosh, you know, it cost $300 or whatever, whatever the money was at that time. And I began to understand, this is how it's kind of priced out, and people are saying yes, so I understood that part of it. Didn't know, understand how to do it became very interested because we were living in a town next to Norwalk, Connecticut. And Norwalk, Connecticut, for some reason, has the largest collection of WPA murals in America. They have 34 murals in this city that is not a big city. These are paintings that were painted in the Depression by artists of the Depression that were hired by the federal government to paint paintings in public buildings. These are, these are gigantic murals that are in post offices, in schools, and in courthouses, and in town halls, and this is what it is. And they were painted in the 30s. A painting can be dirty for maybe 30 or 40 or even 50 years, and then you gotta really do something about it. So these paintings that were, that were cleaned, uh, created in the 1930s, by the 1970s or the 1980s, they were, starting to show the wear of it all, and particularly since they were public, um, there were other problems associated with it, and so they began to think, well, we have to fix these. They couldn't afford them by themselves, so they went out to the corporation, so Xerox would do whatever, you know, restore the mural in the Norwalk post office, and IBM would restore the mural in the whatever. And so the way that this became um, done is that there'd be articles in the newspapers and magazines and all forms of promotional things on television, and you'd see what they were. And you'd see, well, who does this? Well, there was some man, and who is this man? And how is this man able to do this? And he had a whole crew with him to work on these things and, and reading these articles. Um, and I, I kind of knew a little bit about it, but not very much from my restorer friend. But they weren't willing to share a whole bunch of information with me because of there's a, I was just talking to this gentleman in the front row about this. Um, it's not what you're using to clean the painting that's important. Um, he said, does Windex work? Yeah, Windex works on certain things, not all things. But it's more, how, how do you use that Windex? How do you apply that Windex? How wet can you make this happen? And, you know, um, this painting over here that has tons of cracks in it, very open, ooh, don't use the Windex. <laughs> or if you do, be really, really, really careful. I wouldn't touch it with the Windex. So I, I'm not here to tell you how you do it. Because if I tell you how to do it, then you're gonna wreck things. And I, and my, my teacher told me, I, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Brett, read this article about this man that was doing these restorations and where he learned. And he learned from a man named William Haney, who was from Ukiah, California, and I'm in Connecticut. He learned from William Haney 30 or 40 years ago from William Haney. So if William Haney is alive, he must be a pretty old guy. And so I called him up and I said, my name is Blakey Hines and I'd be very interested in, in having you help me learn how to do this, and I read articles about you, and would you be willing to help me? And you know what he said? No. <laughs> no. No. Okay. So I called him back again. I waited. Are you really serious about no? Yeah, I'm really serious about no. The answer is no. Okay. Waited a little bit, Why? called him back again. Why are you doing this? Why are you calling me like this? What's wrong with you? And I said, I really wanna know. I really wanna know. 
He said, well, I'm an 88-year-old man, and you know, I, my career is finished. And I said, but I read so much about what you did. Would you, would, you, would you do anything? Could you help me in any way? Give me advice? Tell me where to go, what to do? I want to know how to do this. And um, there are graduate degrees, you know, very limited, uh, very uh, theoretical, no real practical experience in it. So you learn how to clean a painting in theory. They're not going to give you paintings to clean just to see how, how it will go. Anyway, so Mr. Haney said, no, 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 no. And so I finally said, you know, I really want, he said, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Hines. It'll, it's going to cost you something. And I said, well, I'm prepared. How much will it cost me? $2,000 a day. Oh. Oh. What do you think of that? He said to me. Wow, pretty expensive, Mr. Haney. How many days do you think you can afford? Not many. <laughs> Thank God for my wife. She had a little money. I went out to see Mr. Haney. And he, he had a, a woman that was his assistant named Barbara, and Barbara, I talked to Barbara on the phone about making all these arrangements, and I didn't even know where Ukiah, California is. Two and a half hours above San Francisco, that's where it is, in the middle of the Sonoma Valley, the Sonoma Hills way up there, and, and um, that's where it is. And fl flew to San Francisco, rented a car, driving up to Ukiah, California, don't really know where I'm going to go to, and, I, and so I went to Ukiah, California. I'm to go to the airport in Ukiah, California, and directly across the street at number 257 is the house that I'm going to go going to go to. Checked into the motel, got into there, um, everything, called Judy, I'm, I'm here, I'm all set to go. Hey, you know what? I'm going to go and check this out because I want to be there the first thing in the morning and I don't want to fool around trying to figure out where this place is. I'm going to go find it now. I um, drove out there, across from the airport, 257, and you know what it was? A completely boarded up house with plywood on every single window and door that hadn't been painted for 50 years. You see houses like that around here. They're a, they look like they're abandoned houses, but not totally abandoned, because why would somebody board them up? I, um, I remember I, I, I pulled into the, into the yard there, or the drive there, and saw this, and my only thing that I did was I just sat in the car and began to cry. I just began to cry. And I didn't know what had happened, I didn't even know what this meant, uh, I, I didn't know anything. And, and I had sent him half the money, and um, oh man, and we could not afford this. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe he's just gonna meet me here, maybe tomorrow he's gonna meet me here, and then I'm gonna, he's gonna take me to some other place, and then I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna be in this place, and that's where it's gonna be. And so that's what it's gonna be. And so I, I went back and called Judy, How are, how's everything? Oh, just great, <laughs> oh wow. Um, my big problem was um, I never went to sleep that night. I could not sleep. I was up all night long, and the next day I'm paying this guy $2,000 a day, and it's like, oh my God, oh my God, this is terrible. The more anxious I got, the more I couldn't sleep, and oh my God, what if he doesn't there? What are we gonna do, and blah, blah, blah. And so, sure enough, I went over there at 8.30 in the morning, and he came out of that house. I said, I'm surprised. Yes, I like it that way. I said, you don't live here, do you? Well, I live behind it. I said, I thought this was completely abandoned. Well, that's good. And he was a very eccentric man. And, um, and he was wearing a white lab coat all the way to the floor and a beret, a French uh, art, artist beret, you know what I'm talking about, the blue kind, had her tip to the side and had a little goatee, like um, the classic artist, French artiste, just like that. Looked just like that, but he was an old man. So he came in there and he was like, whoa, and he, he had a big work area that was all greatly lit and everything, and he wasn't doing much work, but there was tons of stuff around, lots of it, frames, paintings, everything, and, and there it was, and um, he said to me, um, 
Well, I want to lay out the ground rules with you, Blakey. I said, yeah, okay, tell me what it is. He said, well, first of all, if I don't like you, we're done. <laughs> really? And he said, what do you think of that? And I said, Mr. Haney, I think I can make you like me. <laughs> and so I said, how can I make you like me? You listen to everything I say, and you never disagree with me. And, you, and he's talking to me like he's scolding me. And OK, OK. And another thing, I don't want you to write any, you don't, you don't have to write anything down. Nothing's to be written down. And I don't want you to bring a tape recorder in here and start recording me. I said, how am I going to remember? I'll make sure you remember. And I said, well, okay, Mr. Haney, I have one question for you. How long is a day? How long do you want the day to be, Blakey? I don't know. I'll have to see. And he began to tell this gigantic story about his life, about his work, and, and, how, and he had bits and pieces of art from in the European tradition, American European tradition, that went all the way back into the 1500s. Mm -hmm. He had a fantastic story about how he claimed it and how he got it. He would worked on over 50,000 pieces, he claimed. Uh, he had all these formulas and ways to work on things. And what he was going to do is he's going to show me how to do it. This is how you clean a painting that is uh, with a particular type of varnish from a particular type of error, and, and this is what it is. And, and I had seen enough art to kind of get it. You know, I, I knew it. I'd seen thousands and thousands of paintings before I ever saw Mr. Haney. And so I could recognize things. But, I, but you know, we're, we live in America. So the, what I'm dealing with is, is artwork that's painted from, say, oh, I don't know, 1820 to 1940. That's a very narrow range, very specific country. Uh, I'm, you know, any European paintings I'm working on were brought maybe in the 1890s when people were traveling on the grand voyages and bringing back Italian paintings. Uh, I'll tell you something about Hungarian paintings. I worked on Hungarian paintings. They're all folded up. Folded up. And they're, they're on canvases folded up. And why are they folded up? The Hungarian Revolution, they came in and confiscated all intellectual property. They took all the books out of the houses. They took all the paintings out of the houses. And they became the property of the state. And so anything that left Hungary had to leave with a permit, a stamp on the back. So these people would cut them out of the stretchers and fold them up and put them into parts of their luggage and, and their thing. That's where the Hungarian paintings are. And so the, I work on European paintings, um, um, but not very much because we live in America. So Mr. Haney would show me those, and, and we began to learn how he did this and all, all sorts of stuff like that. Formulas and techniques and, um, and um, repairs and ways. But Mr. Haney was a man that lived at a time where his productive life was from just prior, just after World War II to the 1980s, he was all done. And the bulk of his expertise, the bulk of his knowledge came from the 1950s, the 1960s, 1970s and then as things happen things move along techniques are not the same materials are not the same um, there's ways that are changing and that was what was happening I began to talk to mr. Haney about his methods and the ways ways that he worked on paintings but then saying well you know I, I, I've been I've been looking into the Smithsonian Institution and they have they have courses and they have lectures on cleaning paintings, and I, I, I've heard about biological detergency and using biological detergents to clean. You know how your body cleans itself without wrecking it? Um, how whenever you, you know, I get something on my pants and I'm, yeah, you know, that old saliva works pretty good. <laughs> it, it, it's, not be, it's because it's not just pure, pure water. There's stuff in it that makes it work good. Mm -hmm. And so his reaction was, don't do that, don't do that, oh, don't do that. I said, w w why not? Well, they just wreck everything. Mr. Haney, you're telling me that the Smithsonian and the National Gallery wreck everything? Yes, they do. I said, oh, come on. Well, eventually I finished with Mr. Haney and came back and had a relationship with him on the phone. And he would tell me about this. And he'd say, Blakey, I want you. And I'm only 40 minutes from New York City, Manhattan. 
I want you to go into the Metropolitan, and I want you to go into this room here, and I want you to look at that painting. And you tell me whatever it was. And you tell me what you think. I go in there, look at it, come back. Holy cow, Mr. Haney. I think they've repainted the whole painting. Yeah, it's too perfect, isn't it? It's too, it's too fine, or it's too something. He said, now, I want you to go back and I want you to make an appointment to try to talk to somebody about what they did and how they did it. And they're not going to tell you. They're not going to tell you. And so he made, made it feel like they were ruining everything and everything was a closed door and that was the end of that. There's no point in going off dealing with them. And so I um, decided that I was going to do that anyway. I had no education in art, really, except from a practical experience. And so I was going to go to these, these workshops with people at the Smithsonian or the National Gallery in New York. And I thought, well, I'm going to be dealing with Dr. So-and-so or Professor So-and-so or you know how all that goes? Mm -hmm. I wonder what he knows. So what I did, I'm, well, again, I'm, uh, New Haven, Connecticut is another 40 miles in the other way, Yale University as a British Art Conservation Center, and, the, and, and they have people that, you know, they have this gigantic library. And I went in there, and every month, I go and I photocopy 500 pages a month on these journals, on British journals. I, I can't speak any other language. I, the British, the Canadians, the Australians, the New Zealanders. Um, sometimes there's ones where they don't expect people to speak the language, like the Japanese will do it in English. Um, anyway, and I, I, I began reading these journals about how they worked on things. How do they clean paintings in the 1930s? How do they clean it in the 1950s? How do they clean it in the 1980s? All forms of this. How do they repair tears and everything? Because I thought when I went to New York, I'd have this great intellectual conversation with somebody about, no. I said, you remember how they worked in the 1930s? Or what, what are you talking about? Oh, I doesn't make any difference what they did in the 1930s, Blakey. It's what they're doing today. And I'm dealing with these young guys, the young gals that are graduate students who have no clue about the history of anything. And I'm not putting it down, but they didn't. And so, um, but I learned some of their techniques about how to do things. And sure enough, biological detergency was a part of it. You know how the, the soap industry and the toothpaste industry and the shampoo industry helps in cleaning things without wrecking it, your hair doesn't get destroyed, your skin doesn't get burned up. You know, a painting is like a skin in a way, on a very delicate surface. Now how wet it gets and how whatever, and then so it's cleaning methods that are based upon elevating the pH or lowering the pH. Um, temperature plays a difference. How you, wet, how you wet water onto things that you can't wet water onto. You know, water beads up, well, you know, we have things in our saliva, in our, in our fluids in our body called surfactants, which allow water to wet onto things that are oily. And that's how I began to change for Mr. Haney. In the repair of tears, I mean, I, this is something that I do a lot of. Um, you know, big tears, you know, rips and you name it, you know. Um, there's nothing outside of bad, bad, bad fire damage that I can't fix. And the only reason I can't fix the fire is because it's been it's been so it's been so so scorched. But you can see the tears in this, you know, big flaps. And, okay, how Mr. Haney used to work on would work on this is not how I work on it today. And it's the rise of synthetic mediums and heat activated um, glues and different types of supports. And this is what it is. And so um, his methods were one that would take. Practice, 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 and finally you get to the point where you finally master it enough where you can do it. Not so today. It's about the technology. I'm at home right now creating a video uh, for my book that I wrote, but it's a whole other story, and, and it's all sound engineering and things like this. So how do you know that? It's the technology, my goodness. And so the change in what I'm doing today has a lot to do with the technology. I could show you how to fix a painting that has a tear in it with the materials, and I could teach you how to do that in 
three hours and you would know how to do it. Not so with cleaning so much, but, but repairs like that. It's, a, it's the change in technology. And so I, I keep up on the technological aspects of what, I, of what I'm doing. And so um, very ironically, or maybe, maybe that's, I think that's the right word, um, tears don't scare me. Cleaning scares me. Cleaning scares me. And the reason why it scares me is that if I look into any of these paintings, see what scares me in this painting here? Um, I can handle the white. Uh, I may be afraid of the green. I would definitely be afraid of the entire background. And it's because of what it's painted with. Paint is going to be animal, vegetable, or mineral. You know, animal and, and mineral aren't so, they're kind of strong. But I think vegetable, ooh, you know, you can wreck vegetables pretty easy. So depending upon what the pigment is and how the pigment is made, I want to get into pigment analysis, but I have, to get, I have to do that. I have to understand, what is this color? What is that? I mean, we can look at it and say, oh, it's a brownie gray, blah, blah. But how do they make that? What is that made of? You know, what is that? And so that I have to be very, 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 very careful in that. Um, and so that I am working in a, in a way that I have to run tests on these colors. Is this going to work with that? Because sometimes you come up with a universal cleaning formula that really does work with everything. And then you'll, you work on one where it goes, you know what, I can clean this entire painting, but I can't clean that green right there. And you don't <laughs> want to find out too late. So I'm working in a, I'm working in a way that I'm, I'm testing it through, so I'm not experimenting on it. Hope this works through the green. No, I know it's going to work through the green or not. So that I'm, I'm doing that, I'm keeping very, 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 very small areas. So I'm, I'm working through square inch at a time. It's a, it's a matter of being, um, can you handle the tediousness of it all? <laughs> and, you know, the area, Mr. Haney, old Mr. Haney, I asked him a question about this, and, uh, and, and he was pretty much right. I said, Mr. Haney, how long does it take to master this? How long does it take before I can really do this in a real excellent way? And I thought he would give me a conventional answer. A conventional answer would be an answer of like, well, Blakey, after 20 years or after five years or after 10 years, you name the time period, that's one criteria of it. Or how many incidences are you dealing with this? Well, you know, when you do this 20 times and you do it 50 times and you do it 100 times, I thought it would be some number that he could quantify or even approximately quantify or quantify in time. No? He said, well, I'm not quite sure of the number, but it's something like when you made 10 really bad mistakes. <laughs> oh, please. That's why I'm here to see you, Mr. Haney. Well, let me tell you, Blakey, you learn by your mistakes. Everybody agree to that? That's life. You get to a certain point in life where you finally, that finally sets in there. <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. Oh, boy. You know, I made that mistake. And, Sure enough, that's what it was. And so, very interesting. I, I, I've had those through the, through the course. Uh, it's been a long time since it's happened. My worst one was the smallest one. My worst one was the most tragic one. My worst one was the one, why did you ever think you could work on that? And this is what it was. It's this big. This big. You think working on easy would be easier working on small than big. This is not that. This is very small. Painted on copper. Hmm. Don't know whether I've ever even seen a painting painted on copper. I've seen a painting painted on wood, fabric, uh, even ivory, or things like that. Copper? Hmm. Ah, I think I can handle it. And so what it was, was a... 15th century picture of a monk. Beautifully done. Just so exquisitely, like a, one of those things where they must have had one brush and they hit one hair in the brush. And what is this? How do they do this? You know, it's like 
four or five hundred years old and it's unbelievable. And it, it's dirty and needs to be cleaned. I don't know what I was thinking. Whoops, there it goes. Oh, my God. These are my paintings. These are paintings that I paint, okay? I know how to paint, okay? Okay? This is my painting here. I know how to paint. I, I make my living as a painter, too, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm talking about restorations. So I know how to paint. So I thought, well, I know how to paint. I can repaint it. Or I can fix it enough where I can fool people with it. I fool, fool people all the time. I, I can fix this and with all this, and you'd never know. You would never know. Um, on the visual spectrum, you'd never know. X-ray or infrared or ultraviolet, you could see it, but you'd never know. And I work on paintings that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, where all they want to do is to see where it was that was bad. And they can't see it. I can do it. This was 25 years ago, though. And I don't even know whether I could even do it today. But so I, I kind of fixed it the best way that I could. And so I went back. I don't know whether it's easier to, it's easier just to say I'm sorry. And to, so I, I, I was willing to let it go and just see what the reaction was going to be. Came to the door, and she was a woman maybe in her 50s, and um, in Reading, Connecticut. And so <coughs> came to the door, and got it, even standing in the door, and I, oh, I have everything. And I, there were two or three of them, and I have this little painting. I handed her this, the, the little painting, and the first thing out of her mouth was, oh, you've ruined it. Yes, I know. I know. I know. And she said, No, you don't know. You don't know. And she said, Tell me what I don't know. And she sat down on the couch and she began to cry. And she said, My husband battled lung cancer for two years and he died last spring. We were married for 35 years and this is what he gave me when we were married. And It was worth about $2,000, and I paid her the $2,000, but that was the easy part. I came back home to Judy, and I said, maybe I shouldn't be doing this anymore. And I really, really, really lost confidence, really lost confidence, where everything I was scared to death of, afraid, that wasn't so bad in the long run, made much more cautious. Don't ever take anything that you don't know what you're doing, ever. That's a lesson learned. So unless you know how to do it, you know, and I've, I've actually exercised that. Even, even last month I had one of those. I don't really know how to do that. Uh, ethnographic objects. Ethnographic objects are objects like, oh, something that is like, you know, painted in Togo, Africa on a skin with whatever this is I don't even know. And that's a whole specialty. You know, it looks like it's a painted object, and you could, well, I don't know what this is. I mean, at least with European paintings and Americans, there's some sort of standardized way in some ways. So I learned my lesson there. The other lesson that I learned was, in the tedium of my work, there's two things that would happen. Oh, I wish this would hurry up. I wish this would hurry up. Or, this is so boring. You know what you do when you hit those buttons? Stop. Stop right immediately. Don't go for another minute longer. Don't do anything. Stop. Lesson learned. You know, because it's tedious. You've got to work your way through it. You know, and if you can't handle it, then don't do it. You know, but I have lots of things. I work on 10 to 15 things per month. So maybe I can't handle that, but maybe I can handle that. And I, I, and I can go to that, and I can do that. The other thing that happens, and I'm aware of, of this pretty soon, how long can people concentrate on something before they go, gosh, you know, I've, 
lost my focus. I can't hear anymore. I, I, what is that? 35, 40, 45 minutes? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe only 20 minutes. Maybe only 10 minutes. But depending upon how focused you are and how aware of our, you are and how awake you are. So that you have to watch yourself there. And so that's what I do. I work on these paintings that are owned by people, mostly. Big museums are a member of the American Museum Council. Have I worked on works, paintings from the Farnsworth? Yes, only donated pieces, not in their own collection. They, they, there's a regional conservation center in Williamstown, Massachusetts, where that, all that goes to. Local historical societies, local house museums, uh, I've done courthouses and things like that where, you know, the judges and that type of thing, um, but not too much. I, I, work on, I work with individuals who have one thing. Boy, oh boy, I tell you one thing. There are people that have these unbelievable paintings and they never knew it was unbelievable except that Aunt Joan painted it. That was so unbelievable. And they don't even understand who Aunt Joan was or, you know, whoever the name is. And they, or who these things were. I remember our, one of our greatest finds ever, Judy, our greatest finds ever, that allowed me actually to build my studio, was this. Painting 12 inches, that's not big, by 20 inches, owned by some woman that lived in the middle of Stanford, Connecticut, in a very regular neighborhood, in a very regular household, and a very regular person. And, and this painting hung in her bedroom because nobody liked the painting enough to have it high hanging in the, um, in the living room. Where did you get this painting, Mrs. Martin? Well, it was my grandmother's. Where did your grandmother get it? Well, my, my grandmother got it in 1952 and, and she was a maid at some big house in, on Cortland Avenue in Stanford and that's where she got it. And they when she retired, they gave her this painting as a token Unusual painting, painting of hummingbirds, hummingbird, painting on oil, hummingbirds, sitting on these wild tropical flowers, which passion were flowers. passion flowers. Mm -hmm. Very elaborate, very ornate, red and, and white um, hummingbirds. Yeah. Um, Brazil. 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 Before I went over there, she called me up and she said, I have a painting that I'm thinking of selling because I, ha I need the money. Are you interested in buying it? And I said, tell me the name. Is there an artist on it? What is it? Oh, it's hummingbirds and just like what I described to you. T tell me, is there a name on it? Well, I think it, it's head? Head? He. H I said head or he? H-E-A-D-E. -E. California. Mm. No. What? He. Martin Johnson He. Yes. From the Hudson River School. <coughs> yes. Uh, Martin Johnson He. Oh, I thought maybe three or five hundred thousand, but I didn't want to tell her on the phone. Because <laughs> I hadn't seen it. Is this a print? What is this? Well, I said, Mrs. We had a gallery that our art began with a W, and I, I learned something about if you're in the business, you want your, that's why A, 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 you know, you'd be the first name up there. We're the last name. <coughs> I don't know what we're thinking. It just sounded good. Um, and so she, how she found me. How did you find me, Mrs. Martin? Well, because um, 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 I called A, accent, and he told me to call you up, Tom. And so, and I said, well, so you want to sell the painting? Yeah, you know, a, a guy came in this morning and he had, he offered me a thousand dollars for it, and I'm I'm not trying to say a word. A thousand dollars? Why didn't you sell it to him, Mrs. Martin? You know, Blakey, he, he drove in a, he drove into my driveway in a brand new Porsche, and it made me mad. <laughs> that he was only going to offer me a thousand dollars for my grandmother's painting. So I said no. That was at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so she's calling me out at 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. She says, 
said, well, you know, I saw him at 10 o'clock in the morning and I said no, and then he called me up around 1 o'clock and he said that he had made a terrible mistake. And he wanted to now offer me $100,000 for the painting. <laughs> really? What do you think of that, Mrs. Martin? Well, I think there's something wrong. I said, you better believe there's something wrong. When somebody's offering you a thousand to a hundred thousand in only a couple of hours, he had every idea of what that was worth when he saw it, and he was just trying to rip you right off of it, and uh, hoping that you didn't know anything because you're living in Stanford, Connecticut, and your grandmother was a maid, and you don't know anything. That's what he was hoping for. And so she said, "Well, what do you think it's worth?" And I said, "You know what? I don't know. I ha would have to see this." Well, how do you think we should sell it? I said, well, the, I don't think we want to sell it through a private deal unless we really know the dealer that can deal with that type of caliber of painting, and I don't really know. But I do know that Sotheby's in New York handles things like this all the time, and they have experts at this, and, and, they, and, they, and they, would, they would be willing to help. I called up Sotheby's, and I said, I have a Martin Johnson Hughes painting the head of the American Painting Department and the president of Sotheby's was out there by 6.30 at night. Wow. <laughs> All right? Wow. Wow. And they wanted to take it. And so they took it, and they were bonded, and all this other stuff. And Anyway, and so the auction is coming up. The, the timing was pretty good. The auction was coming up, a big Ameri American auction. You want to be in the right auction. And so the auction was coming up, and, the, and it was... Um, uh, a few weeks away or whatever this was. I can't quite remember the timing of it. And so Mrs. Martin called me up and she said, Sotheby's called me and they have somebody in Washington, D.C. that's willing to pay me $750,000 for the painting. Do you think I ought to sell it? I said, no. Because there's a guy in San Francisco that's also willing to pay $750,000. And if they're willing to pay $750,000, I bet you they're willing to pay a million dollars for it. So it needs to go to auction. She said, okay, and went to auction. It was going to go to auction. And they gave her the special room upstairs. Have you ever been to Sotheby's in New York? Okay. For all the big VIPs, like if, you know, if President, ex-President George Bush wanted to go and buy a painting at Sotheby's, he could go there and he could sit up above and watch all this and bid on it and you would never know he was there. And it's exclusive, these exclusive rooms. And, and that's what they gave her, that. They flew her son Raymond, who was in the army from Texas, home to see it. They sent for a limousine for Judy Knight, remember that? Yeah. And the they picked it up in a limousine and we went up there and we watched this. And the painting was um, the 13th painting up, which in an auction is pretty quick mm -hmm. when there's 500 paintings or you got to sit there all day or whatever. 13th painting up. Oh, I don't know. Did it sell in 30 seconds, Judy? What is it, a minute? Something like this. $1.3 million. Mm -hmm. As fast as it could go, boom, 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 up, 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 up. That's the end of that. And okay, let's go to the next one. You know, kind of like there's no glory in it. There's no like, wow, that was pretty something. Because they, 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 they have another one they're putting up there like this. It's unbelievable. This is, this is the big leagues. This is the heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it was. And, and next thing I know, knocking on the door, New York Times, People Magazine. I want to do an interview. I said, no, 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 no. No, look, you can't do that. Well, Mrs. Martin didn't want to tell his family about this. They thought she would, they would want part of it. <laughs> Stupid Blakey. I got to the end of all of it. You know what? I had made a mistake. Gosh. I never asked for anything. The painting sold for $1.3 million, and I never asked for anything. I never got anything. I called up Dee Dee Brooks. She was the president of Sotheby's at the time. Dee Dee, I've made a terrible mistake. I should have asked you for something. You know, part of the premiums, the buyer or the seller. You know, the sellers, they don't, I mean, the, um, the buyers, they don't, there's a premium that they put on. I, 
I, sh- I should have asked you for something. Yeah, I know, Blakey, but everything's all done and all the contracts are signed and everything else. I said, I know, I know, I know. I mean, I, I, I guess lesson learned of the hard way. And she said, well, wait, wait a minute, Blakey, before you get off the phone, there's something that I, may, maybe you would be agreeable to this. Um, we're willing to pay you $39,000 that be enough? I said, Didi, I'd be so grateful for that. Well, we're going to do that. We're going to pay you $39,000 already as a finder's fee. Mm -hmm. And I said, great. And I said, what? Why? And this was her answer. Blakey, Sotheby's has been around since 1769. And we're not only interested in your business, we're interested in your grandchildren's business and your great-grandchildren's business. This is something that your family will never forget. And you will tell people that when they have to remember about things that they'll remember Sotheby's. And I said, you're right, you're right. And so I moved to Maine, that's how I built my studio from there. But I, I'm not a dealer, I'm a restorer, I'm a painter. I only have two seconds left. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Your watch is fast. Is it? This is my book. This is my book. This is my illustrated atlas on the first battle of Bull Run. This is my book that I spent eight years working on. I gave up television about 23 years ago. That gives you a lot of time. (laughs) You can only read so much. You can only do so much of this. You can only do so much of that. And then I discovered this. And so, but this wasn't my first book. This was my second book. This was my first book on Connecticut in the Civil War. 652 pages. This took seven years. This took eight years. This is really good. So is that. But anyway, um, I, um, I, uh, and so I have that too. You know why, when Maynard told me about talking about Maine living and making a living in Maine. You know, one of the things that I know that a lot of you can here can testify to is making a living in Maine. The people that live in Maine sometimes wear many different hats. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a little bit of this and they're doing a little bit of that. And if that falters, then they have that. And, you know, so it doesn't all come crumbling crumbling down at one time. And, And so I make my living as a restorer, as an artist, as an author, as a publisher. And then there's one other element of my life that I'm not going to force down anybody's throat. But I'm also a deacon at the West West Rockport Baptist Church. I'm a Sunday school teacher for the last seven years. And I can testify to one thing. God has been very good to me. God has greatly gifted me. God has greatly enriched me. Not that believing God will give you that. But I do give the glory to God in all of this. Because I don't understand how any of this happened. I have a degree in economics. How do I write a history book? This book on the first battle of Bull Run is the only illustrated atlas for the battle. I'm getting response back to people that this is the finest book that has ever been written on it. I'm not saying that it's a prideful way. I'm saying that as a way like, God, how did that happen? What's that about? It it happened because of how all this happens too. Um, I'm I'm willing to work on things and I'm willing to give 100% to it. Mr. Haney in California had a phrase that maybe you know this, the good is the enemy of the best. Don't try to be good enough. You want the best and always go for the best. So that um, these you only have one opportunity in because you can spoil them very, very rapidly, very, very quickly. Um, Judy, do you remember how this painting went? Oh, it was all done for three years or more. Totally done. 
Um, somehow I, she used to call wrecking it, why'd you wreck it? I'd go in there and reworking it all over again. Because what is, what's wrong with it? I, I don't know what's wrong with it. And I'll do that. And so that I'll, I'll keep reworking and reworking and reworking. Um, this I redesigned four times. I don't know. These are all labors of love. So that whatever you do in your life, whatever it is you put your time into, I know my father told me something, and he was the man that got on the train for 42 years to go to New York. He said, Blakey, don't do what I did. And I said, what, what should I do? You need to find what it is that you love, and then you do it, and then you'll never work a day in your life. This is what I love. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'm willing to entertain some questions. If not, I'm sure there's reception in there, right? Yes. Okay. You said it all. All right. Did I hear you call my name out in the stillness of the night? Did I feel your arms around me just before the morning? 